Okay, very good morning to everyone. Friday 25th of October, hope you are well. Also, a quick shout out to, to Kurt, although it was for Sam, giving you some love here for the big game coming up this weekend. Uh, depending on the outcome, Sam and I will uh, wear the, uh, the, the respective top of the champion when it comes to, to Monday morning. But back to, back to markets, not actually too much for me to talk about at the moment in regard to uh, actual macro developments. There's been very little updates on the usual things like Brexit. Um, also, there's a few comments that came out of the Vice President Mike Pence yesterday that I think are just worth being aware of. Uh, so very much a reflection really across the charts of what we're seeing this morning. The Dixie's pretty flat, uh, so quite quiet in the currency pairs. Uh, likewise, in the equity index futures, you can see in the center chart here, I've got a, uh, an ellipse around quite a, a significant downturn that we saw in the NASDAQ futures after the close last night. And that came after Amazon's earnings. So we'll have a quick look at that as well. But uh, in a nutshell, their earnings drop year over year for the first time since early 2017. Uh, fixed income futures basically flat and oil just um, kind of gravitating around that pivot level at the moment in the futures market uh, at around the $56 handle. So I'll leave the charts for, for Sam and I'll go straight into uh, obviously the ongoing situation that is Brexit and where are we at the moment because what we've had last night is Boris Johnson has I think now for the third time called for an election but in terms of timing it's quite interesting because he's looking to hold a December election which would be the first time since 1923 uh, if it does in fact go ahead at that particular time in the calendar and last time that did happen uh, back in 1923 it was a hung parliament now, a couple of things uh, just to get you up to speed. In terms of political parties, traditionally, uh, they tend to avoid winter votes. Um, pretty much a, a standard thing because of the weather conditions. It's very hard to canvas support after dark. And they have to get out you know, to people in the cold and the rain you know, on the polling station day. So it's very... Um, it can be a bit lackluster in terms of the actual participation rate and therefore also the build-up as well, trying to cultivate support in your campaigning period, which is part of a preset period of time that we have for any general election. Uh, another thing as well um, that one I saw a journalist from The Spectator was saying, which I thought was quite interesting, he said he thinks one of the attractions of a December 12th date for the Tories is that universities will be on holiday. Uh, Tory folklore has it that Theresa May's decision to have an election during term time cost her Tory seats such as Canterbury. The point being here is that university students, if they are registered to vote, are usually registered in their university town. Uh, and so what this date of December 12th is trying to do uh, is if they're on holiday, then they're not actually able to vote because most university students are not from the town of which they um, actually live in, in terms of home. So that could be another tactical move uh, as well. Uh, what's happened, though, on the back of this? What are the opposition parties saying? Because as we know, you need uh, two-thirds uh, majority of parliament to support you in order to get an election underway. And Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn uh, said yesterday that his decision on backing the Prime Minister's bid for an election depends on the length of extension that is granted from the European Union. And this is what we've been waiting ever since those letters got sent um, to Brussels earlier this week from Boris Johnson as part of then the exercising of that Ben bill. Now, that kind of following this chain through, what are the EU saying? Well, EU diplomats, they are meeting this morning. So definitely, I think there could be some uh, tweets, some source comments. So keep an eye on the regular journalists as well to be breaking a couple of headlines. But in all reality, um, what Europe have been saying is that they want more clarity from the UK before agreeing to any type of extension. What they don't want to do is be seen to be picking a side by either, at the moment, obviously a lot of the opposition parties want a delayed, protracted, long extension because they feel that would take some power away from Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson ideally would like a November 15th if it, if it was an ideal case a few days ago. Obviously now he's tabled a December 12th date and all of this is earlier than the January 31st that was initially said to have been in play, the three-month period. 
obviously the earlier the better and it kind of uh, supports that argument that uh, he can just focus on campaigning on that people versus parliament kind of mantra. Uh, so in, in terms of an actual EU answer, a couple of the sources this morning uh, on Bloomberg suggesting that we won't actually get anything, could well have to wait until Monday or Tuesday next week before they make a decision. Obviously, it's a bit of a weird one at the moment. Boris has put it out there, but a lack of commitment almost again from Labour about what exactly they want to do because they want to wait for Europe, but Europe wants to wait for the UK. All in all, it's just, um, you know, hence the reason why really this situation epitomises the need for a general election because this is a, a kind of a lame duck government where nothing can get done. Uh, and it, you would think that there's only a, a, a so long period of time that this can continue before it's inevitable a general election needs to take place. Um, I was going to talk through a couple of the latest um, election opinion polls on, on Westminster, but, but in all honesty, um, even though we know Conservatives are kind of uh, ahead at the moment, um, and, and obviously the Liberal Democrats have seen a decent return as well to the fold, given their stance of revoking Brexit to capture that real Remain vote. The idea here, though, is kind of like with Theresa May in, in April 2017. The polls were suggesting around a 22.5 percentage gain for Conservatives, and it absolutely did not materialise and backfired. I think opinion polls really are, need to be taken with a large pinch of salt, largely because they're a reflection of people's opinions of what they would do in the future, i.e., what would you do on the 25th of October if you were voting for an election on the 12th of December? Well, there's a lot, hell of a lot that can happen in those two uh, dates. And we saw that with the 2017 election, whether it was changes with, what was it, dementia tax, whether it was... Theresa May not uh, showing at those televised TV debates, whether it was Labour kind of really galvanising the younger demographic vote. All in all, it meant that all of those polls that were done before were rendered basically redundant. So I don't really see too much point looking at them at the moment. Obviously, the resounding sentiment is that Boris would get a majority. Uh, but I do actually, on these points, think that um, he will actually seal the deal. I don't think he's going to do what May did, which was kind of uh, disenfranchise a regular older demographic supporter. Um, I actually think Boris has got a really strong um, argument to make. And it's a very, it's one that's simplistic and will resonate, I think, with his base and will capture, I see not too much threat realistically from the Brexit party. But for him, the sooner the better. Uh, in that respect, I would say. So that's it for Brexit. In terms of the actual pound, what is going on? Uh, not a great deal, to be honest. And it, you know, depending on whether EU come out and say something more explicit about their commitment on duration, whether that falls in the Conservative way or the Labour way, uh, might cause a bit of reaction. But as I said, it might not be until Monday, Tuesday we get the result for that. So it could be fairly, fairly quiet, but worth being vigilant, I'd say, on Twitter for updates. The other news story that I thought was quite interesting and, and to, to bring you up to speed on was Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, it's these American politicians, it's almost like they can't, can't help themselves stick their foot in their mouth. And, uh, and he gave a speech yesterday where he criticised China's actions against protesters in Hong Kong. That's, just, that, that's what you don't talk about at the moment. I mean, you can criticize China for manipulating its currency. You can say uh, they do all kinds of other things, but just don't talk about Hong Kong at the moment. Uh, they do not take very kindly to that. Um, the Chinese foreign ministry came out about half an hour ago and said they stated that they are extremely indignant about VP Pence's speech and they resolutely oppose it. So if you think about it, at the moment, uh, the stage in which we're at is that we've got this partial trade deal. They're continuing dialogue. Actually, top US and Chinese officials are discussing plans by telephone today. Um, Beijing will request cancellation of some planned and existing US tariffs on Chinese imports, according to people briefed on the talks. Um, essentially, what the US want is to China to double its annual increase of purchasing agricultural goods to 40 to 50 billion. Whereas China say they want to aim to buy at least 20 billion and then look to scale it up as and when those December tariffs 
are removed and existing ones are also rolled back. So I guess actually thinking about it, this is fairly um, reflective of how other trade talks have gone. This time though it's come from Pence rather than Trump. Before they have these important phone calls or face-to-face -face meetings, the Americans do tend to kind of wag the stick, so to speak, and it almost feels like that again. The only problem here is, as I said, culturally, the Hong Kong is a very uh, kind of tentious issue in, in mainland China uh, at the moment. And so talking about that, I'm not sure that's going to have the best result going into these conversations later on today. Fallout of those talks, a breakdown of the partial trade deal, of course, goes into that, that kind of um, continuous trade war cycle that we've looked at before and perhaps if that did happen you could see quite a negative reaction in markets and you'd be looking for downside in US equities at the moment which otherwise have remained relatively supportive through the earnings that we've had throughout the throughout the week so yeah you could could spark a flight to quality bid uh, I guess then if they're meeting today you probably though won't like now or start to hear comments until a bit later on late European afternoon I would say but something to be aware of the one earnings report I just wanted to, to mention was Amazon I did show you the Nasdaq saw quite an aggressive drop last night um, in terms of the the headlines there uh, earnings drop year over year for the first time in, in basically two years projections for their operating income and sales in the period uh, fell short of analyst estimates their shares actually fell as much as just over nine percent last night so obviously nine percent is a is a huge move for a company of that magnitude um, Jeff Bezos waking up this morning find, finding himself now number two in the billionaires top list um, so Mr. Gates back on top again um, cloud computing unit remains the cash cow of course when you're looking at the metrics that underline the strengths of this company uh, sales in that division actually rose 35% in Q3. However, 35% sounds pretty impressive, but that's the AWS, their kind of cloud divisions. That growth was the slowest since Amazon ever started, since they started reporting that unit's performance. Um, and this comes amid increasing competition in this area, particularly that from well-funded rivals, um, essentially, uh, Microsoft's Azure and Google's cloud platform, but the Microsoft one's probably uh, the biggest in line with competition in that space. So yeah, Amazon uh, was a little bit weaker in that regard. Uh, just quickly, let me just bring up the earnings calendar for today, just so we know who's coming out. Uh, as per usual, Fridays do tend to be uh, a little bit more quiet, uh, as earnings season typically hits its peak during midweek. So today, Companies that we've got, Verizon, ABN Bev, uh, they're probably the only two real bigger names. The others are more kind of mid-cap size. Calendar-wise, what else have we got to come? Uh, German IFO is coming out at 9 o'clock. I'd be interested to see what the general kind of sentiment is at the moment uh, in regard to forward looking over the next six months. So current conditions, but business outlook for the, um, what they foresee for the future. Always going to be quite telling, particularly with that weak German data that we had yesterday um, I did you know just to summarize the weakness of that German data and why the IFO could be particularly interesting was this was a comment I picked out of the the market report this is the company that compiles the data on the PMIs and if you actually read the report the German numbers yesterday because we remember we had that real blip in the euro where the French numbers came out services was really strong and we almost instantly reversed it on the German figures uh, the German downturn in the economy continues employment falling for the first time in six years services in Germany a 37 month low business sentiment turned increasingly negative expectations falling to the lowest level since November 2012 so that later po latter point be interested to see whether that translate also into the IFO reading so I'd say on the balance probably some scope for a downside surprise uh, so it might be worth just keeping an eye on those European assets at 9 a.m. Otherwise, for the session, it is pretty quiet. The U.S. Um, uh, University of Michigan sentiment is the final reading for October, so it tends to be typically not that market moving. Uh, so other than that, and any update on the trade dialogue with those high-level talks going on to conclude more detail on the partial deal, um, they're probably the key things that I'd be monitoring fundamentally today. All right, I hand you over to Sam. And if I don't speak to you before, I wish you all a very good weekend. 
and uh, even though I am wearing this shirt, I must say, come on England. Yeah, we'll be having words about that uh, later. Um, we'll have a, a quick look over the charts uh, to, to begin, I think, start off with, uh, with currencies. And, and Euro obviously had a decent enough move to the downside yesterday. And um, I was speaking to one of the guys who was about to go into stage three, and they were short on the, on the Euro. And, and looking at uh, potentially taking profit as it came down, and what a good level. And they decided to, to come out as it just happened to be the low of the day, the, the high of the 16th, S2, good test, a couple of goes at it, didn't want to break and you can see we've, we've rebounded since. So 1.11.31, key point to, to mark up obviously for the day and, and then the, the, the week now, uh, I guess, uh, to keep an eye on. And then to the upside, just where we, we found resistance is uh, a bit choppy, but on the low of Wednesday as well. Uh, so if we're keeping a, a watch on that, um, probably worth having potential look at the trend from yesterday's lows to see if that's respected on the third test also you can see perhaps as well now what is the high of today the high of yesterday evening once we found support on that one 11.31 to the upside the couple of resistance points that we would have to get through uh, before uh, coming to the pivot you've got highs from yesterday uh, afternoon as well in the mix and on the pivot itself you've got yesterday morning's low so quite a bit of uh, resistance above where we're trading but a really key support from yesterday's low if that was to go then I do feel you are looking down to towards 111 uh, handle uh, other than the, the low of the 17 so been in a bit of a, a small range I think everyone will be pretty happy to, to get this week done with it's been a quiet one Monday next week does look quiet as well but certainly Wednesday Thursday Friday look like they could be pretty good days I have to say Having a look at the pound uh, as well, decent move in, in correlation with the euro yesterday, stopping at the same time the euro did, whether you want to call it because of this level, I think more the euro was dictating things there. Uh, key levels to, to the downside today, uh, if we can get through yesterday's low, then you know I do like the look of, of this area, 127.73, but it's, it's kind of range band, isn't it? You know, we, a failure, I guess, in hindsight, looking back in a couple of weeks to clear above 130. Um, may may be uh, you know an opportunity there where it's uh, you know a bit lower down, uh, but uh, where we are, whether that really happens or, or not, time will time will tell. See some big developments to come, no doubt. So a medium term position at the moment in the pound probably doesn't make too much sense. Uh, I would say, looking on a, a 15 minute chart just above the pivot, uh, so the pivot area for both the euro and the pound, pretty important, and we're in the small range where we've just broken through the low of the day, but Fail test of that, and we bounced 10 ticks already. Uh, so, a confirmed break below that low, then sure we can look down at yesterday's lows as well. Bit of a, a zone above the pivot as well from the morning uh, area of support around 9 a.m. to uh, the closing highs that we had yesterday evening. So, I don't know. On paper, it looks quite choppy currencies uh, for, the, for the pound anyway. Um, I don't think there's much harm in just sort of saying, you know what, let's, let's wait and see. Uh, is anyone really going to get in a new big position today? I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to have to wait and see that. Uh, look over at S and P, which you know has been resilient, like Ant was saying, through the earnings, and you know we're we're still trending high. I think there's there's a nice trend line on from the lows that we had from Wednesday, uh, the second low here. That's just been respected this morning. So just dropping this down to 15 minute chart now once that trend line sorts itself out and you can see here worth having on especially for you know the afternoon when things are going to pick up below there I'm a seller above there and certainly the time it could well be the pivot in the mix as well I'd be happy to to stay long a lot of resistance up at uh, yesterday's highs in the R1 and uh, on a relatively quiet day it's not really too surprising that that held uh, as well so yeah you can see we're just getting squeezed in and, and that's really how I would look to play this pivot is obviously important maybe shorter term trend line uh, as well uh, and then obviously those highs uh, from the uh, the week putting it onto a 240 what would happen if we get a break above those those highs this week where you've got quite a lot of resistance so unless we had a really big push above 30.25 uh, which is also the all-time high then uh, I wouldn't be getting too ahead of myself just yet. Quick look over at gold, which pushed higher yesterday. We finally got that, that trend line break that we've been eyeing up, admittedly, either way. And, and, uh, 
and this was what I was waiting for. I was really thinking just about, uh, let's just get that on, you know, the how unsure I was about which direction gold was going to go, and it was just a case of, well, under here to sell, above there to buy, and of course, um, you know, I happened to be out of the office when it happened, but uh, a decent push, and what an opportunity, let's be honest, you know, it came back, retested, and, and then did go. Uh, and we're now trading up at where you would probably have said the first real target would have been that higher, the 11th, and uh, we're quite a lot higher <coughs> going into the end of the week. Can we confirm a break above here? I'd say that's pretty important going into the back end of the week because uh, obviously this, as it stands, uh, here looking 60 minute, 1508 is a big resistance level. Uh, uh, so yeah, a confirm break above, happy days for gold, and uh, you've got to imagine that's going to help drag silver through as well which you can see also has broken through some key resistance points uh, and trend lines as well uh, maybe a bit more to go to a really key resistance point here at 18 uh, 10 you can see those highs from the 26th so for those that are watching that would be the the area that i'd be looking to to be comfortable if i was still long let's put it like that oil another market which dragged higher not just yesterday well a bit yesterday but of course the the wednesday push and break above that key resistance point around 55 uh, we almost yesterday afternoon getting to uh, the highs from you guessed it the 26 a lot of commodities looking around those highs from the 26 but again can we close above there will be important we haven't had i guess a, a close a, a, a retest back on 55 on another day so that could be a, a nice area of support to potentially look at um, but again, relatively um, subdued start uh, to the day. And yesterday was, you know, didn't finish massively higher. Uh, probably just wait to see uh, into the afternoon for oil, gold and S&P, but certainly some nice levels in the mix there uh, as well. On the open, let's have a quick look at the DAX. 30 minutes into it now, almost choppy. Uh, not surprising for the DAX on a Friday. Pretty range bound over the last, well, let's call it almost 24 hours. Uh, so no harm in waiting for a bigger move to come and of course on this longer term chart we're the highest we've been for, for quite some time uh, in the DAX and actually just looking here on the weekly continuation we just remove the pivot you can see just how important this area is let's get that line drawn on from the, the week of the 23rd of July 2018 so pretty big uh, pretty big uh, level there can we close above would be massive uh, not you may well get a bit of profit taking into next week, but of course a big one to come next week with the Fed, uh, with non-farm payroll, some GDP numbers, inflation numbers out of the, uh, the EU. It's uh, one I'm really looking forward to, especially after how slow I would say this one uh, has been. Uh, as usual, any questions, uh, please do let us know. Good luck to all the England rugby supporting fans. Bad luck to the New Zealand ones. Uh, it's going to be a blinder. I hope you'll have uh, a good weekend and good trading day.